Oh, good morning. I hope everyone had a wonderful Valentine's Day. Those of you, I mean, you know, sometimes it's funny to me when Valentine's Day seems to be more about receiving love than it is giving love. Uh, and I, that's one thing I love about Valentine's is to realize that, you know, God doesn't need a holiday to love us. You know, and so to protest that, I didn't get my wife anything. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'll make sure I don't ever do that again. Amen. Uh, no, actually, I asked my wife what she wanted for Valentine's Day, and she said, uh, I want tickets to Texas Tech opening weekend of baseball. Then I went, I love you so much. The greatest woman ever. So anyway. Um. Would like for you to remember Travis Burge and Annie. They're in New York today, and I know Travis has his auditions as we speak. So I went ahead and sent him a text from us saying we're thinking about him and praying for him, and I know that means the world to him, even though he's in the concrete jungle uh, and we're in the flatlands of West Texas, we can still cover him. Amen? Amen. And that's, that's what we do, and so I'm really excited for him and, and Annie and, and hope for the best. Uh, once again, I'd also like to thank everybody that has come out and helped with Fix It Up February. Um, it really has made a difference, and I do appreciate that. Um, like Pastor Allen said, if we get enough this Saturday, uh, we'll probably take the last Saturday off, which is great. Um, church is looking good, and we appreciate it. Real quick question for you this morning. Where is your refuge? And uh, the reason why we ask this question uh, is because a lot of us would say, oh, it's in the Lord. It's in the Lord. Now, here's how you can think about where you hold your refuge. What in your life, if it was taken away from you, you would just absolutely fall apart? Now, I'm not talking about necessarily losing someone to death. I'm talking about like if you lost your job or if uh, you lost your friends, if they didn't like you anymore. And I know that never happened because you guys are awesome. Or what if it was your savings account what if you had to dip into that and it got way low would you panic and and think oh no what am I going to do or maybe you watch Fox News live or CNBC and and oh my goodness if the if the government does this then then everything's going to fall apart we live in a society it seems that uh, we are manipulated by circumstances to do foolish things I remember Y2K does anybody remember that 1999, and it was the Christians, hear me on this, I'm speaking about the Christian culture at that time that exploited this opportunity to make money, used fear for you to buy the supplies you need in order to survive when everything crashes. As soon as the clock turns, 12 o'clock in 1999, Cars would no longer work. Gas stations would shut down. I mean, people were flocking to the grocery store. And I'll never forget, we were watching the ball drop at the house. And, and I was ready for it. Here we go. When I say I was ready for it, I think I had a bag of ruffles. You know, that's all I need, right? Ruffles. I really wasn't too concerned about it because we live in Texas, right? I mean, you don't have to love it. You have to go too far before you find a duck or a cow. And, and you know, we'll eat like kings and queens. Anyway. Uh, when that thing hit, it was almost like the Christians were frustrated that the world did not come to an end. Lord, how could you do this? We're supposed to, to be proven right. We're supposed to fly and, 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 and you're supposed to come and, and the world is supposed to fall apart and you're supposed to rescue, rescue us. And then we were going to show everybody that we were right and they were wrong. And I'm here to tell you right now, if that is the heart of a Christian community, that he hurries up and comes back, then we're not about our Father's business. In fact, for us, it should be, Lord, we need you to delay as long as you desire so that we can be about your business and love more and show them who you are. And so when I ask, where is your refuge? If it's in anything other than the Lord, just like when 9-11 hit, it was a big shock. How could this ever happen? This is on our own soil, and, and now we all need to go get our Christian rifles and sight them in and get ready for the terrorist attacks and, and kill anybody that looks like a terrorist. 
No. You need to stay busy about your father's business. I don't care what the world is doing because in him is our refuge. It never fails when you speak to people of generations that they would say the world is increasingly getting worse. It's just not getting better. And here's what's amazing. When I would talk to some of the older folks that are in nursing homes, I would say, is the world as bad back then as it is today? And some of them would tell me, no, we just covered it up better. And so you realize... There's really nothing in this world that is going to be of value to us. Therefore, why put your refuge in something of this world when it can only belong in somebody who is not of this world? Today, I want to look at that, and we're going to learn a little bit about David. He's my favorite Bible character. David started out as a young boy, and he was tending his father's sheep, and and what happens is... Saul, who's king of the Israelites this time, gets big-headed and think, thinks he's all that. And so the Lord displaces him as king and tells Samuel the prophet, go to the house of Jesse and you'll find one there that I will make king. And so he goes to Jesse's house and Jesse has seven sons that are good-looking and, and they have hair and, and they're, they're skinny and everybody thinks they look great. And as each one of them pass by, Samuel says, these are not the ones. Do you have any other kids? And he's like, yes, David, he's a run. He's outside tending the sheep. And he says, bring David in. And he brings David in and the Lord says, there's my guy. And here's what I love about that story is because David in some sense was a reject According to man. Maybe some of us relate to that here this morning. I'm not trying to step on any toes, but how do they feel? But the Lord saw him and said, no, there's a guy after my own heart right there. And so Samuel anoints David and says, one day you're going to be king. And once he got done anointing this, Jesse looks at his son and says, okay, you're going to be king, whatever. Get back out there and tend the sheep. You see, you would hope at that time that he would become king, but he's not. In fact, it's a a much time afterwards that his father sends him to the Israelite army where his brothers, the fighters, are. And this is when this happens. Goliath. Talking noise against the people of God. And David gets a little frustrated because he's a little hothead. And some of you also might relate to that. Don't raise your hand. And I don't need you to get angry. Count to ten. Okay. And he hears Goliath cursing his God and says, no, I'll kill this guy today. And he goes to King Saul and says, hey, this guy's defying the Lord. Send me. The Lord has used me to kill lions and bears. And and the Lord's going to kill this guy today. And so he sends him out there. And you hear this story about David and Goliath. The stone into the forehead. David walks over there, cuts his head off. And David defeats Goliath. And everybody celebrates. Surely this is the time where David's about to become king. They parade him around. He carries the head of Goliath in a pouch just in case anybody wants to see it. That's gross. <laughs> and as he's paraded through the streets, they go, here comes Saul, who's our king, and he's killed thousands. Oh, but here comes David. He's killed tens of thousands. The Israelites love to exaggerate. <laughs> kind of like us. And Saul the king gets very jealous Now, keep in mind, David was anointed by God that someday he's going to be king. But from this point, we find that David has to begin to run for his life because King Saul is jealous and tries to kill him over and over and over and over again. So now David is another reject. He cannot hang out in royal places. The the royal people are looking for him. The authorities are looking for him. And and Saul has his army after David. So David has to go to the outskirts of town. And then here's what happens. In 1 Samuel 21, David finds himself in a very awkward place. Let me explain this to you. He is at a town called Goth. And the king is called Ashish, or Ashish, I don't know how to pronounce it. And he is the king of the Philistines. Goliath was a Philistine. 
he killed Goliath. David's on the run, and the only place he can find refuge is where the enemy is. Really think about the trouble that David's in. He is in the place of the people that really want to kill him. He has no safe place. Some of us in this room, it seems like everywhere we go, there's our enemies. Amen? And it seems like the Lord may have forgotten you and, and you're wondering what's happening. The more you try to do right, the more everything seems to fall apart. And it's difficult. But look what David has to do. You know it's bad when you have to do this. Verse 10 of 1 Samuel 21 says, That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Goth. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of the king Achish of Goth. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was there, their hands, when he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, marking the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. And you didn't think the Bible was interesting? Yeah, take that picture. Ashish said to his servants, Look at this man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? Whew. The king said, man, this guy's no threat. Get rid of him. Now let's really play the part. Put yourself in David's shoes. Everywhere he goes... People want to kill him. He has no friends. He can't go to his family. He is running, and he continues to go to places where everybody is. The only thing he can do is act insane, out of his mind. And I want to say this, just my opinion. I believe partly he was. Think about the heights from which he was. He kills Goliath, and now he is running for his life. He has no home. Obviously, it looks like God has forsaken him. Oh, but he hasn't. In fact, as we continue down the story, David becomes king after the death of Saul. So now he sits upon his throne. And in our minds, we begin to think, man, what would I do if I was king? First of all, I'd go after everybody that got against me, and I'd show them who's king. Uh, you know what David does? He first ponders on the Lord all the time, and he begins to write psalms. And he writes Psalm 34, and this is what's unique about this. This is the psalm as he is remembering when he was in the land of the Philistines, and he had to act insane. Listen to this. Psalm 34. Verse 1 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. I want to say that again. Those who fear God lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. 
Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Beautiful psalm. Verse 1 through 7 is a reflection of where he came from. One of the things I love about this scripture is David is writing from his experience. I like all different types of music, but I cannot stand bubblegum pop music. Anybody else here agree with me on that one, right? There's nothing like an 18-year-old with millions of dollars trying to sing about how hard life is. (laughs) My jet has a flat, what am I going to do? The people I like are the people like the old blues singers who actually sing about something. Oh, how about when you really hear those old hymnals? Oh, it's not trying to be catchy. They're telling you where they came from. And that's what David's doing in this writing. He's telling you, man, I remember how horrible it was when everybody wanted to kill me. And he didn't declare how great he is as king. He declared how faithful God was even in his darkest hour. And he begins to say to everybody in his camp and the people that read these psalms, God is faithful. It is time to praise his name. You must seek refuge in him. Now look at verses 4 through 7 on the screen here. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Stop right here. If you're like me, there's times I get afraid, and I pray out to God and say, please handle this. And the next day, I get up and do it again. Lord, please handle this. And the next day, I get scared, and I say, Lord, please handle this, and this is the way you should handle it. And pretty soon, I quit praying that God would handle the problem, and I begin to pray and tell God what to do. As if he really needs my help. As if I, he doesn't quite understand what's going on and I'm going to help him out. It's like how my wife is when I put up Christmas lights. I'm putting up the Christmas lights. She's trying to tell me how to do it when she's not on the roof. God is on high. He's the one that's putting this stuff together. He doesn't need our help. But yet, isn't it true that sometimes, man, we get afraid. Let's just be honest. The Lord understands that, but our prayer should be, Lord, you continue to do what you want because my refuge, my peace, my safety is in you, not the outcome. That is huge. I'll never forget, we were doing baptisms, and I met with a lady who was being baptized that day. She still attends this church. I'm not going to call her out, but... uh, As I was up there, I said, would you like to say a word to the people? And I did not realize what she was about to say, but she's like, yes, I uh, am about to go to jail tomorrow, and I just want you to know I know the Lord is going with me. Blew my mind. I'm like, no, if the Lord was with you, you wouldn't be going to jail, right? Isn't that what we do when we get a parking ticket or a speeding ticket? Lord Jesus, help it go away. And the truth is, the Lord's like, no, you got a ticket because you got a lead foot. And here she was going, no, I deserve to go to jail, but I'm not going alone. He is with me even in my darkest places. And what was so amazing is she spent her time, she got out, she came right back, and she's doing great. Not because of the correctional facility. Not because of this amazing church. Give me an amen. There you go. But because there's a God that can be your refuge. A living God that is our refuge today. 
Look at this. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Think about that. Even in your darkest time, like David with saliva running off of his beard. If you're of the Lord, you're still radiant. I love six. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. How many times do we think we have troubles when they're really not troubles? Because isn't it funny how we think we're having a hard time until you meet somebody who really is having a hard time? To be able to say, Lord, I know that troubles may come, but I know that in you there's refuge and you will deliver me from all my troubles. Now, when we read the story of David having to act insane, you don't necessarily think, well, man, the Lord is really not with him because he's all in this terrible place. Hmm. Because the Lord is with him, he is not defeated in his darkest hours. Same thing with you. Even in your darkest hours, and hear me on this, even if you have created it, yes, the consequences will come. Can I get an amen? Grace is not the escape of consequences for our wrong decisions. Can I get an amen on that one? But even in that, as you go through your consequences, he is still your refuge if you will rest in him. You see, as he's given this reflection where he came from, then verses 8 through 22 is the invitation to believe. I love this part because David is reflecting and going, man, I remember that time. I remember when I was so nervous and scared. And all I had was the Lord, so I just prayed out to him, and he delivered me. He was there with me. And once he remembers this story about how faithful God was, he can't help but tell other people how God has helped him. Therefore, he begins to declare the praises of God to others and inviting them to worship God with him. Look at verses 17 through 22. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Do you believe that scripture? Notice the scripture does not say he delivers them from all their troubles in the way they desire to be delivered. Some of you in this room may even say, but Pastor Travis, you don't know about my past, and I got some deep scars. And I'd simply say, I can prove that he is faithful. You're still here, aren't you? You're still breathing. You still have an opportunity. He is still walking with you. And he, he's very patient with us. Can I get an amen? amen? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Oh, how beautiful that is. If you're struggling right now, just know he's with you. He loves it to, to heal the brokenhearted. Do not be discouraged even though you are going through a hard time. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them from them all. Once again, he protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Verse 20 is a prophetic statement because it also refers to the fact that Jesus, in his darkest moment... In his death, took refuge in his father, and not one of his bones were broken. Even in death, the Lord is still faithful. So then what do we have to fear? Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Put that on your heart today. It's not those who act christian -y. Those who truly take refuge in him. He becomes their source of confidence. He becomes our source of assurance. He becomes our source of strength. Let me ask you to do this. Take a moment this morning and think back and remember the faithfulness of the Lord. Take a moment and really think about that. When was he faithful to you? Some of us in this room, we're really upset with God. Let's just be honest, we're really frustrated because... Things didn't work out the way we thought they should. We did everything we were supposed to, and it didn't work out. Therefore, we cry out to God and say, why would you allow this to happen to me? 
Remember, God has life in his hands. He is not here to reinstate life the way you see it should be. He is actually here to give you life that comes from him, which goes beyond this reality. And if we could just embrace that, it's not that we would escape troubles. Can I get an amen? Amen. It cracks me up whenever... uh, I hear many people in the Christian community that would say, no, when you follow Jesus, everything goes perfect. No, when you follow Jesus, there's going to be a lot of resistance, not only in the world, but in your flesh. And there's going to be times when you feel that he is not faithful. You're going to feel like he is not there. You want me to tell you the most powerful thing you can do in that moment? Begin to praise his name for his faithfulness. That's when it's real. Has anybody ever seen somebody get upset only when they're caught? I was watching uh, one of those judge shows. You know, they got so many of them now, right? And there was a girl that had vandalized another girl's car. Because I guess that's what you girls do when you get mad at each other. (laughs) At least guys just punch each other, right? And so she vandalizes her car, and this girl takes her to court, and she's busted. They had, they had her on video or whatever from one of the camera lights, and so the judge is like, you know you're going to have to pay this, and this girl starts crying. And she says, Jesus Christ has forgiven me, and I think the court should too. And I believe everybody else that was there that had a case that day was listening to see if the judge would forgive her, and they're going to claim that too. I believe Jesus has forgiven me, and the court should too. And I love what the judge said. Oh, yes. Not only does Jesus forgive you, we forgive you, but you do have consequences for your actions. And she cried and cried and cried, and the judge kept saying, it's not going to work. The question is, had she not gotten caught, Would she have been broken hearted? And see, that's what this world tries to do. The world tries to tell you, in your circumstances, should define who you are. Therefore, if you get caught, you should be apologetic and sorrowful. But if you don't get caught, then you celebrate that you got away with it. The way of the Lord says, I don't care if anybody catches you. If you're doing things wrong, it should spring up repentance within you. Because that's not who you are. City Slickers, the movie, has a really nice part in it when uh, one of the main characters has a girl approach him, and he's married, and they're, you know, they're on this vacation, and one of the girls is flirting with him, and his friends are like, dude, you should hook up with that girl, and he's like, not going to do it. They're like, wow, man, this is your chance to relax and, and be free again. You're away from your family and your home, and she wants to be with you. You should hook up with her, and, and, and he says, I'm not going to do it. And they said, why? Nobody will know. And he says, but I would know. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. To me, I think that's when we truly find a refuge in the Lord, is we're not really swayed by the opinions of others. We are more concerned with keeping our relationship with the Lord intact. Why don't you do this? Well, I don't do this because that's what the Lord does not want me to do. Why don't you uh, rob banks? Some of us in this room say, because we tried it before and it didn't work out. (laughs) I don't rob banks because the Lord says he'll supply all my needs, therefore I don't have to go out and steal things. Yeah, but you're broke. (laughs) Monetarily, probably. But yet I'm still here and he's still faithful. Some of the most powerful people I have ever met in my life were not the people that everybody saw as spiritual and holy, but they were the people that were on the sick bed declaring the praises of God. Those who were in pain yet praised the Lord for their breath. Those who were right beyond passing, praising his name because he is with them. Man, we need to be that way. Amen? We need to be that people. Notice this experience the refuge of the Lord and be the refuge of the Lord. 
There's two differences. Those of us who are in this room that are hurting and and what happens is people hear about this place. We don't advertise. People come in. They meet with people who've been through some of the similar things they have been through. They begin to experience who the Lord is in some weird way. And they begin to experience the refuge of the Lord. And all of a sudden their life starts to get replaced. Now let's just be honest with ourselves. Many of us in this room, if our life was to be restored the way that we want it to be, that would be the most detrimental thing that could happen. So many of us, we lose everything and then we start to gain it back and we forget the Lord. Only to find ourselves falling again and wonder why we have no stability and no peace. It's because we don't find our refuge in Him. Imagine the person that has nothing but says, I have you, Lord. All of a sudden, hits the lotto. Did anybody hit the lotto this last week anyway? I just, just want to make sure because if anybody here, just let me know. We can talk about tax write-off and tithing. But anyway, they hit the lotto and they become a millionaire. They become the same person. Oh, my goodness, you got all this money. Now life is different for you. No, it's not. It's just money. It can go away. But my refuge is in the Lord. Therefore, if the Lord asks me to give it away, I don't have any problem because he's my refuge. I have met many people who are monetarily poor and had much peace and have met people with incredible means that are more stressed out than any of us. Are we a church called refuge or are we a refuge to others? That is our challenge today. This city has a lot of churches, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of churches. I don't want to be a church. Can I get an amen? amen? I don't want to be just a place where we come together and since we're all together and we count numbers and, and everything else that we're just, quote, a church. I want to be a refuge to others. When I have my sticker on the back of that car and it says the refuge, know this. It started a long time ago. We put that sticker on our cars and it's just a plain Jane sticker. And many times I'm driving and I'm about to drive horribly and the Lord reminds me, hey, the refuge sticker's on your car, settle down. So I settle down, but I really do hope that one day, and this has happened to me before, that somebody saw that sticker and said, are you from the refuge? And I said, yes, I am from the refuge. And they said, man, I hear that that place has some real people and that y'all don't judge anybody and that you love people. I'm like, man, that's exactly right. And, man, if you would like to come, just know we'll love on you, this and that and the other. And they had no idea that I pastored refuge. And I love that. Because it's about his refuge. But we would be doing this city a disservice if we just... Get the refuge of the Lord and keep it to ourselves. No, we need to be that for others just like David was. David talked about how the Lord was his refuge and then he challenged others and he walked with them and said, Come with me, let's praise the Lord together for he is always faithful. This morning as I came to church, a uh, beautiful lady came up to me this morning. And it, it's Sharon Jones and she said, I need to give you a text from my daughter. She said, for some reason, she felt like you needed to have this text, and, and I'll let you read it, and then you can do whatever you want to do with it. Well, it falls right into what we're talking about this morning, so I'm going to read it. It says, I came to your candlelight communion service this past December with my mom, Sharon Jones. I have worked two of the larger United Methodist churches in the United States and traveled to many places internationally for ministry, I have never experienced what I did that night as I walked into your sanctuary. Your church is a place of true sanctuary and peace. I felt the love of God and the presence of His Holy Spirit there in such a mighty way. I felt welcome and immediately realized that I was more concerned about my three-year-old son and his trains on your platform than anyone else that was there. At one point, while chasing one of the three toddlers through the sanctuary, I nearly knocked over one of your pastors who was serving communion. He said, oh, excuse me, and he said it sincerely as well. He was trying to help me, or help get out of my way. He wasn't angry or rude. I didn't understand. I felt so much shame and no one there was making me feel shame. I realized that I was 
shaming myself, and I could leave it there at the precious feet of Jesus. Thank you for hosting us and blessing my family. Your church is so special. Hold on to it with dear life. I wish I could say that I solicited that response. This happens because of what the Lord is doing here. This happens because of what we're doing. And I praise God that she felt that way. But I don't want to keep it here. Well, this is where the church happens, right? No. It happens out there. And everywhere you walk, you can be a place of refuge to somebody. Because I know it's hard. It's easy to love well here. But when you get out of that working world and that Monday hits you in the face, the last thing you're feeling at that moment is, yeah, I'm going to love well today. I'm going to love well with a hammer. That's when it matters. Because let me explain this to you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be finished. It is not about pews, carpet, building. It's about what we do out there. And the Lord has called us to be his refuge. He did not say, refuge, be a good church in Lubbock. He's got plenty of good churches, and I mean that. I think he said, refuge, be extremely dangerous in the city of Lubbock. Everywhere you go, take me with you, take my refuge with you, and be refuge to other people, and see if I don't blow your mind. To where mine and Pastor Allen's response is, do all you have in mind, Dad. We'll do whatever you ask. So this morning, if you need his refuge, oh, hear me, most important, trust in him. May he be your refuge. But if you have experienced his refuge, get off your hind end and let's be a refuge to other people. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together. Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much for being our refuge. For Father David showed us that even in his hardest moments that you were faithful. Father, help us to know that. Lord, no matter what tomorrow may bring, you are there with us. Father, whether we are in famine or whether we are in feast, Lord, you are everything that we need. Lord, may we go away this morning celebrating your name, praising your name. For this morning, we are all blessed to be in your refuge. Lord, give us the strength to take your refuge to others. Help us love well. Help us break the chains of those that are bound by loving them the way that you love us. But Father, we know that if Jesus has set us free then we are truly free indeed. Do all you have in mind with us, Father, for we are with you, heart and soul. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone said, amen. Go and be a refuge.